Three-year-old Mary Chilton gripped tightly to her mother's skirts. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she watched the boat slip away in the fast-flowing current. Her father had already boarded with most of the men when the soldiers appeared over the brow of the low hill. The Dutch captain, intent on escape, cut the mooring ropes and let the barge drift into the main river. The rest of the men were left on the shore with the women and children. They had travelled to this small creek on the estuary of the River Humber from the farming villages in that quiet corner of England where Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire and Yorkshire meet beside the River Trent. Members of the separatist movement, they had sought to reach Holland to practice their faith away from the religious persecution of the Church of England. People were running now, scattering into the marshland as the soldiers marched down the hill. Mary watched the barge carrying her father disappear into the dense sea fret. The group were quickly rounded up and taken to the nearby church of St Andrew, where they sought shelter in the large porch. During the night, they prayed for salvation and speculated on who had betrayed them. Suspicion fell on the captain of the Dutch barge. They feared for their fate. But the local militia, unsure what to do, allowed them to slip away. They eventually made their way to Holland, where they joined the rest of the community and established a congregation in the town of Leiden. Growing up in Holland, Mary and the other children made new Dutch friends, learned the language and practiced the customs of the country. Fearing this assimilation, the congregation decided to emigrate to the Americas, where their children could be English and they could worship freely. They chartered two ships, the Speedwell and the Mayflower. Two unsuccessful attempts were made with both ships, before the Mayflower sailed alone on the 16th of September 1620, with 102 passengers on board, including Mary and her parents. The 66-day voyage on the northern route so late in the year took its toll on the passengers and crew. 49 passengers and half the crew perished during the harsh winter journey. Amongst the dead were James and Susanna Chilton. But Mary herself, now 15, survived the journey to begin a new life in the new world. Immingham's connection with the Pilgrim Fathers is still celebrated today on a granite memorial near St Andrew's Church and in the street names of the town, including Bradford Road, Alderney Way and Chilton Close. On the Heritage Channel tonight, North East Lincolnshire's role in founding modern America, a town made of tin and plans to turn Grimsby Minster into an aquarium. Welcome to the Heritage Channel on Clee TV, where we explore the fascinating history of North East Lincolnshire in a monthly roundup of news, views and other stories. In tonight's programme, we focus on the town of Immingham. This small town and busy port in the north of the region is often overshadowed by its more glamorous neighbours. Alex Thompson, Elise Ballard and Gemma Lingard discover more about this remarkable history. We've come to Wimmingham to find out more about the town's surprising history. When we look at the last thousand, even two thousand, and even going back three or four thousand years, we can see that the history of Immingham is linked very much with the river. So we find that from Roman times, indeed in the 
12th century, boats would land and load their stuff. And it's noted in records that Immingham did have a port of sorts. And then, of course, you've heard about the Pilgrim Fathers. They sailed from here as part of their journey. Most of the Pilgrim Fathers came from uh, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Some of the ladies and the children sheltered in what was the porch at the church. There are lots of links to the Pilgrim Fathers in Immingham. Lots of our streets are named after the Pilgrim Fathers. And obviously the museum, we set up displays in the museum to commemorate the 400th anniversary a few years ago. You know, it's been a very important part of the, the history uh, of Immingham. And there's a continual theme running through the history of Immingham. When people ask what do people do in Immingham, well we don't mine coal and we don't make fabrics or whatever, but what we do in Immingham, it could be said, is that we move stuff. With my silly sense of humour, we could say people of Immingham are masters and mistresses of movement. <laughs> right, and that's why there's three M's in Immingham. But the real growth of Immingham really took off from 1906 onwards with the coming of the dock. The story we want to tell here is about the critical importance of the railways to the making of Immingham. There's an underestimation of the importance of the railways and that's one of the themes we try to tell upstairs. The second is the dynamic nature of Immingham. Immingham has always been at the forefront of developments. The railway company, the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, built and developed Grimsby docks for fish and also for commercial trade, particularly coal exports. But there was a problem with Grimsby, and that was the deep water channel. Anybody who's been to Cleethorpes, invariably the tide's out, so ships had a bit of a difficult time trying to get in. But the railway company realised that the deep water channel touched the coast at Immingham. So when the tide's out, there's still deep water. Finally, the decision was made to build the docks here. So, 1906, they started building the dock. What they did with the clay, the millions of tons of thick boulder clay, very cleverly, they spread it out on the marsh to stabilize and raise the marsh. So they had a wonderful flat pad to build one of the most modern, efficient docks in the country. The third biggest rail freight yard in the world was built here in Immingham. And to use that famous phrase, not a lot of people know that. But even more than that, they built a power station on the dock. This is 1906. Electricity is only just beginning to get going. You could say this Immingham was one of the world's first electric docks. Then when the migrant workers left after building the dock, we needed lots of workers to drive the trains, handle the freight and so on. Where did they come from? Remember, there's only 200 or so people living in Immingham. Where did they come from? Grimsby and Cleethorpes. And how do we get them here in 1906, 1912? We built a tramway. It's known as a tramway. Let's use the modern phrase. One of the world's first, here we go again, interurban rapid transport systems powered by electricity. Oh boy, this Immingham was right at the forefront of things, yeah? Talk about moving stuff. We were not only moving stuff, we were using the latest technology to move stuff. Immingham became one of the biggest ports by tonnage in the country. It's also the biggest rail freight operation by tonnage. Iron ore, coal, biomass. But the most exciting thing is what's beginning to happen now. There's talk of an electric motorway. This country's first electric motorway. There's talk of one of the world's first, possibly the world's first, bioaviation field plant, building wind turbines, the Freeport. When you add it all together, the next five, 10 years of Himingham, and let's use that phrase, watch this space.
To find out more about the town, you can visit the museum and library in the Civic Centre, where we met museum curator John Trevert and councillor George Fox, the Mayor of Immingham. Immingham Hub was developed a few years ago now and within the Hub we've, we've obviously got Immingham Museum. We run around about 2,000 visitors a year which for a small museum like Immingham's we count that as a success and of course we want more visitors to come. We're split in two floors. Downstairs we do the social history so we can see what Immingham was like in the past and we have this fantastic interactive display telling the story of the Pilgrim Fathers. When you come upstairs you will see the story of the economic history told uh, both in print and maps and photographs of course as you would, some artefacts but also a, a huge model railway to show what Immingham was like and we're very proud to have 8,000 and photographs and books and videos, maps, journals. Uh, we've got quite a, a, an important collection and also the museum is the proud host for the Great Central Railway Society's archive here. This is a national indeed international society and they've chosen to base their archive here and thanks to ABP's involvement with us we're going to be developing a, a modern <coughs> multimedia interactive docks room shall we call it with all the latest technology showing Immingham today and indeed a glimpse of Immingham in the future. Heritage of the past is inspiring events today that will become the heritage of the future. Grimsby's fishing heritage is celebrated in the My Fish GY project with a virtual fish tank displayed at Grimsby Minster. Hugh Richards and John Williamson went along to find out more. Grimsby Minster was the place to be for a piscine extravaganza in October. A giant aquarium displayed hundreds of fish designed, coloured and decorated by local children. The designs, delivered by hand or digitally, were spawned into a tank of TV screens. I work at Bloom and Associates and we were approached by a local group who's working with like the Arts Council and stuff like that for Grimsby. And they wanted to create an interactive installation where children could design their own fish and have it put into this live 3D world and see it in all its glory. The My Fish Grimsby project provides a ray of hope to warm the soul. Children need not flounder if they can't get to the church. Fish design contributions are welcome at myfishgy.co.uk or visit the Facebook page if you fancy a dab. This is part of a, a fund from Grimsby Creates, come through from uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport funding. Uh, and it was important to uh, deliver something in Grimsby that represented the town. It's not just for children. All Grimbarians are welcome to have a bite. Just fill in a template and the technology will fine-tune a digital swimmer. Here on this event, it's been quite a young engagement, but we've also engaged with the university and the college in Grimsby, but also had some workshops through very different people of the town. And quite a lot of the submissions that we've had online range from Billy age four to Margaret age 84. There we are, this is my contribution as an artistic fish. It's a Jackson Pollock. Submissions are welcome for another few months when the project will end in a whale of a show. Just go to myfishgy.co.uk, follow the instructions, you can download a pack and follow the upload instructions and once we receive it, we'll spawn it into the digital sea. Spawn, that's the word you're going to use. Spawn is the technical term, yeah. And this is just a glimpse of what's to come. Actually, in February, we have a huge event happening in the Heritage Zone in Grimsby uh, and around the Heritage Centre onto large buildings. We're going to project this virtual sea uh, onto hopefully an 83 metre high building. So watch this space to see what's to come. The organisers want to skate around the details of the precise venue, but Grimbarians might identify a tall red brick building close to Corporation Bridge. It'll be on a massive scale, thousands of fish, each individual and unique to a Grimbarian artist. 
What's it all for is to grow the community, get some art and culture into the town. Uh, there was a big uh, renovation project, I believe, for all of Grimsby. And this is, this is part of it, really, sort of bring the community together, bring everybody together and just enjoy Grimsby. Working in North East Lincolnshire, um, it's a great place to, to live. And I think this area has got so much to offer. This is a fantastic place to live. It's a fantastic place to visit. And it's a fantastic place to stay once you've got here. I know I'm one of those people that came here 30 years ago. It's a very uh, caring community. There are lots of organisations uh, working together here. I believe that we've got a, a huge amount of dialogue between all the organisations, which is certainly getting stronger and better. All our clients are really friendly and they welcome everybody in their home with open arms. A burgeoning town, an opportunity in terms of economic growth that is second to none in terms of our history. Lots of things are happening here. Come and live here, come and work here, come and stay here. Winter Witchcraft, The Tale of the Second Crusade and the Rise of Saladin and the Victorian Christmas at the Old King's Head in Curtain are among the events and activities currently being hosted by Heritage Lincolnshire. Full details are on the Heritage Lincolnshire website. Back to Immingham now where Gemma Lingard visits the Tin Town Heritage Centre to meet curator Malcolm Cullens. I'm here at Immingham's Tin Town Heritage Centre to speak to Malcolm Cullum to find out why this house and Tin Town was built in the early 1900s. The Great Central Railway decided they needed to expand and instead of expanding Grimsby Dock, they decided they would build a brand new dock at Immingham. It's only a small village with just a few hundred people. And because of that, there was no houses. So they built a whole town for the navvies out of tin around where the county is at the moment. And they built these six up here for the docks. I think two were for engineers and then there was a foreman. And quite oddly, the one was for the baker. So it shows how much the baker was important. My grandparents lived down Blossom Way and when my mum and dad got married, they bought the one at 357. I've lived on the same site all my life. You know, although we pulled it down in 1992 and built a modern bungalow. They're not very warm, as you can guess. All it is is a tin on the outside with tundra groove boards on the inside with a piece of 4x2 in the middle. And I have nicknamed a glorified garden shed. When we decided to renovate this or bring it back to how it was we had to do quite a bit of work inside and each wall has had four coats of paint we've tried to give them the colors that was originally but some were very dark so we we have lightened up a lot of the stuff in here is from people who's lived in Immingham many years so not only is it the building but there's so much Immingham history in artifacts Two ladies, Margaret Fulsham and Janet Dimbleby, a local, volunteered to help me. They've done a lot of research. They researched the curtains uh, and have made them all, and they've set it all out to look as, as they would have been in the old days. Uh, and without them, I, I couldn't have done it. So it, to come to visit, you just get a feeling of how it would be in those days to live in here. We normally are open on a Saturday afternoon, that's all, but we're open to open more maybe next year. You can book for a Sunday afternoon uh, via the internet, it's free to do. We don't charge, we want people to come and have a look. We just asked if they'd like to give a donation. One of the best ways to discover more about Immingham is on the tourist trail with Emma Lingard.
Ingham means the homestead or settlement of Immer, and according to Bede, Immer was a thane serving the brother of the King of Northumbria. Along with Healing and Stallingborough, it forms a cluster of Anglo-Saxon settlements in what became predominantly Dane country. And where we are now, which is the former golf course, this is the deserted medieval village of Immingham. Did you know St Andrew's Church Immingham is over 800 years old, parts of it dating back to the medieval period. It was at the heart of this rural hamlet and it wasn't until the 1900s with the construction of the port of Immingham that the town as we know it today grew. It's also the final resting place of Francis Hawkins, a gentleman connected with the Mayflower Pilgrims who on their flee to Holland stopped over in Immingham in 1608. This is the monument to the Pilgrim Fathers. It was given to the town by the Anglo-American Society in 1924. And at the top is a piece of granite from Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, where the Pilgrim Fathers eventually landed. But how did the Pilgrim Fathers end up in Immingham in 1608? Well, a group of them were fleeing Babworth and Gainsborough and they were arriving by land while a group were travelling down the Humber Estuary on a barge and they were to meet here in Immingham on the mudflats to join a Dutch hoy who was to take them to Holland. But the barge got stranded on the mudflats the panic was set in by the captain of the Dutch Hoy when he saw the local militia riding out across the marshland and it fled, leaving behind many women and children who sought refuge in the nearby St Andrew's Church. But of course, eventually, they all were to regroup. They did arrive in Amsterdam and eventually made their way to the new world in America on the Mayflower. Did you know the town of Immingham that we know today began because of the construction of the docks? The tin town behind me was built to house the construction workers. The docks eventually opened on the 22nd of July 1912 and today it is the largest port in the UK by tonnage. Most of the things you eat, drink, drive, wear, even your house all those items may have come through the port of Immingham. And if you want to learn more about Immingham, then why not visit the museum? Well, that's almost all for this third episode of our new series of programmes supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. You can enjoy more programmes on our sister channel, Billboard TV, which covers arts and entertainment in North East Lincolnshire and East Yorkshire, including the local premieres of Three Day Millionaire and Not the Line of Duty. If you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to join our group or on YouTube, click the subscribe button below to make sure you don't miss any of our programmes. If you have a heritage story you would like us to share or to find out more about joining the Heritage Channel team, email news at heritage-channel.org. <laughs> join us next month when we explore the traditions of Christmas and cover more heritage news, views and features that celebrate the unique heritage of our coastal community. <laughs>